Let's start this webinar. So first of all, thank you very much, Jonathan, for being with us. As you may have noticed, we are all very excited with your presentation and your topic. We couldn't stop ourselves from discussing before you started talking. So I'm pretty sure that it's going to be very exciting. For those that have just arrived, we, Jonathan has a problem with his camera. So unfortunately, we cannot see him, but he's here with us. He's going to present and we can hear him clearly. Uh, like in any other webinar, um, please uh, send questions in the chat. Uh, following the experience from previous webinars, I've noticed that uh, sometimes there is really interesting discussions going on. So I think that this time we will accept people questions. Um, if you are if are related with whatever comment we are discussing, we will accept people that are just putting their hands on and we will try to have a conversation. And I will bring in into the conversation any questions from the chat to, the, to, to do it more spontaneous. Okay. So we'll try to be fair with everyone who, who wants to talk to ma make sure that everybody uh, talks, uh, but also to enhance a conversation that has been very rich in, in the past. So welcome, Jonathan, it's all yours. Okay, um, so uh, a little bit about myself to start with. I um, always start off by telling the joke that for 20 years I was in change management and I'm very proud of the fact that during that time I achieved absolutely nothing. Um, and it wasn't until I tried everything, all the change management theory, Lewin, Cotter, Maslow, and it wasn't until I started to realize that I was dealing with emotions and tribes, that I actually started to get somewhere. And um, what I always tell people that I was in a very difficult position. And a lot of my work, I had Bob Crow of the um, uh, Railway and Maritime Trade Union on one side, who is about as far left as you can get, and, and a very nice gentleman he was. He's, he's passed away now. And on the other side, I had the Treasury led by a Conservative government, who about as far um, right as you could get. So. I was in a very difficult position and yet I managed to get everything through by changing my perspective. So um, what I'm going to start, uh, you've almost um, hit the nail on the head in the conversation that went on beforehand. Um, what I'm going to show you is what viable tribes are. Um, tribes form naturally when there's an inherent feeling um, of, of mutual survival. Um, Tribes are different from organizations, social groups and societies, although they may exist within um, those groups. Um, in fact, they will exist within those groups. They're held together by a common purpose, normally survival, but also a moral framework, which I'll come to. Tribes are governed by basic emotions, um, which I call a language before language. They exist in every organization or society. We know they exist, but we tend to ignore them. Uh, we'll talk about them, we'll gossip about them, we'll gossip about the people, but then when we sit around the boardroom or anything, they, they miraculously disappear and we go back to the wiring diagram for the organization. They can become um, a whole nation or they can be a, a small group. Unlike organizations, they are informal but they are self-organizing and mutually supporting. They, are automat they automatically form a viable system by themselves. Um, they have a shared vision, a moral code, defined roles and responsibilities, a transactive memory, prototypical membership, which is cre created through a shared narrative. And I'll come to all of that in a minute. And I believe they're the key to understanding society, politics and organisational change. And if you want to understand what's going on in Brexit or in America at the moment, they give um, a real good insight. The second sort of really important question is why use the VSM to study viable tribes? Um, the problem we have, um, firstly, um, the, the, the VSM is very good at, at, at understanding stability in complexity. The VSM forms a framework which you can use to understand almost any system. The metacism, the recursion and the five systems, I find myself coming back to everything I almost read or do, I start putting it into the VSM 
Now, whether that's just um, me getting obsessed with the VSM, I don't know, but I find it provides a lot of answers. Um, and I'll show you later on how I've managed to put Lerman um, in action um, and Spencer Brown and a lot of other people into the VSM. It can use, I can use it to describe a lot. Um, the, the trouble with the VSM is it can be used, um, it can be viewed and it's mainly, mainly viewed as an input output system. Um, but it can be viewed as a system of self-maintenance and internal processes, which is essentially what we're going to look at today. Um, it can provide a hard or soft systems approach. So um, we've seen with Angela's work in um, Ireland that, uh, on the village where they're using it um, to tease out um, viability as a, in a soft systems approach, um, or it could be used as a traditional hard system and going back to Roger Harden and um, Espero's work, it was, um, Especo's work, it was, um, could be seen as a um, hermeneutic enabler. For me, um, the original aim of system science, which was to create a science of the sciences, seems to come together with the VSM. There seems to be an awful lot that we can put into it and to study other areas of science. Um, so my, what's my approach then? Um, I, I go back to Gauthier's way. Um, what has to happen for all these views to be right? Um, th there's an awful lot of branches to system science and rather than aim at saying one's right or what's wrong, my view going back to Gauthier is that um, all of them have a perspective and, and if you can find the answer uh, what you do is bring them all together. Um, so I, I will start with the laws of form from Spencer Brown. Um, I'm going to try and include second order cybernetics from Von Forrester um, because he started the, uh, some of the areas of cognition which are still um, being used by the inactivists today in that any system of cognition needs to be able to perceive, to remember, to infer, to learn, to evaluate, to communicate, and to move. Um, autopoiesis by Mancherana and Varela, there's an awful lot being written about this, about what is autopoietic and what is not. Um, and for me, I think people have got themselves twisted over that. It's, it's fairly straightforward and it depends on where the boundaries are. Um, Lerman's social systems, um, I've read an awful lot of this, um, heaven help me, and, um, and again, it forms an important understanding or underpinning for understanding what's going on with tribes. Um, most of the modern work being done is by Di Paolo um, in, in activism and um, his recent book, Sense of Motory uh, Life, I think is really important and provides a lot of the low level answers, although it doesn't provide all. Um, we've got the connectionism, connectionists sitting there with distributed cognition and the postmodernists. Um, philosophers such as Giddens, Weber, Parsons, Heidegger, Husserl, and Moli Pontu, and William James. Um, lately onto the scene has come Friston, who's um, an activist with a, a mathematical approach, and um, he, he shows how boundaries can be formed through a thing called Markov blankets, which, which I think is really interesting, because you'll see one of the questions I ask is, where is the boundary for a social system? Um, We've gone to emotions and moral behavior with um, psychologists and neuroscientists such as Damasio, Jonathan Hyatt, um, uh, Joshua Green, the philosopher Rawls and uh, Colin Betty. And lastly, from psychology, and I use psychology almost as um, the end product. This is what I somehow have to achieve because this is what's being observed in, in, in the real world. Um, and largely I take from psychology, I take um, social identity theory by Tashville and Turner, which is about how groups form. Oh, sorry, too much. Um, so uh, a little bit trite, I can put it into place with the old, um, the story of the Sankrit and the elephant. Um, but there's a key difference that I want to make with this story. I'm, I'm sure you're all familiar with it. The four, four blind men that come across an elephant and they all have a different perspective. What you have to ask yourself with that, going back to Gauthier's way, is what has to happen for all these people 
to understand that that's an elephant, because one of them saying it's a tree, one of them saying it's a snake, one of them saying it's a mouse, and one of them saying it's a sheath of leather. And you can see the argument that's about to happen with these four. They believe what they see and feel, but what they have to do is ask a second order question and step back and say, in Guthe's way, what has to happen for all our views to be right? Um, and that's basically the approach I try to take. Now, there's some problems with using the VSM to study tribes. The first one is it's based in management cybernetics. Um, and the problem with management cybernetics is we put people into the various systems. So in an organization, we'll have the managing director in system five. Uh, we'll have research in system four. We'll have the operations manager in system three. Now in tribes, that doesn't happen. Everybody is in systems one. And management cybernetics is distorted slightly from other systems that you have those people in those places. Um, because you'll see in a minute, I describe the metacism as an imaginary system um, after George Spencer Brown's um, approach. Um, it doesn't really exist. Um, we use it to exist to understand what's going on. The only thing that exists in reality is the actual people. But in management cybernetics, they do exist because we put them there. Um, I haven't explained that very well. Um, we also tend to use management language. So um, I change the language a bit. Instead of coordination, I tend to, system two, I tend to be talking about cohesion or harmony or tension. Um, instead of system three and control, I tend to be talking about coherence and meaning. Uh, instead of systems four and intelligence, I talk about anticipation or forethought. Uh, and instead of system five, I talk about beliefs. Um, the other problem with the VSM is it doesn't really show circularity, although the circularity is there, but because it's normally being shown as an input-output system, if you connect the system ones back on each other, then you really essentially have an autopoietic system or an autonomous system. Um, Stafford, I think, instinctively knew this. Um, he had no problem with autopoiesis, and he saw it as a fundamental part of the VSM. But he doesn't really ever talk about it or show it. Um, what I want to show in this is how stability comes from circularity. There's also problems, I think, with the homeostat, which needs to be updated. Um, there are, and I'll go into a, into a while as to why the homeostat is um, probably outdated now in some of its concepts. Um, Stafford tends to use it as a regulator, but it's also a system of state change which um, needs to be incorporated. Um, boundaries. Um, I'll talk about where are the boundaries in social systems because that gets complex as we go between the different systems. Um, the VSM were, and cybernetics in general has been accused of um, by a lot of people of just not showing um, intrinsic human behavior, emotions. Um, and, and there's a uh, Ulrich wrote a long letter to um, Stafford Beer in Think Before You Think. It's published in Think Before You Think. And Stafford um, just couldn't understand in many ways what he was saying because for Stafford, humans are very much part of the VSM uh, from my readings of his book. Um, and yet, um, because of his background in OR, I don't think he showed a lot of the human behavior. Um, however, what I want to do is to show that actually the VSM is a very effective means of showing human behavior. Um, and lastly, cognition. Um, Stafford didn't really talk about the VSM um, and cognitions per se, um, but it's a serious problem now with understanding tribes and the arguments that are going on between uh, representation and connectivism and an action. Um, and lastly, um, we need to be clear um, in the VSM as what is being um, represented. Now, again, the VSM, by working um, fundamentally about identity, fits in extremely well with social identity theory in um, psychology, which is also talking about identity. Um, Viable language, I'll come and I'll talk to you about you uh, in a minute. So moving on, um, circularity and the picture on the left of a network um, is not something you could live in. Things change too quickly, things move through. You couldn't have any coherence 
Um, I talk about a widgie perambulator, and you say, what was that? And I say, well, it was there. And you say, where was it? Because um, it's gone. Um, you need, for stability, circularity. Circularity brings things back. They appear, they remain stable. The picture on the right I've taken from Di Paolo's work to show that um, in autopoiesis and a lot of these other concepts, we show a perfect circle. But Di Paolo's work in an activism actually shows it probably far more that in that network on the left, there will be circular processes that repeat themselves and create stabilization or stable, stable systems. Um, they aren't necessarily exactly circular and it's the fact that they're not circular that they can adapt and use different parts of their process, which is an important um, presentational aspect. The problem you've got when you go into a circularity is that you lock yourself into um, a logic and you also can't see outside because of Spencer Brown, you can't see outside of your um, circularity easily. Um, and normal logic is a poor model of causality in a circularity. Um, the classic barber's paradox who in a village, um, everybody is shaved by the barber or they shave themselves. Which group does the barber belong to? Um, it's a good example. Um, now, Spencer Brown solved this by basically saying they're both right. In one um, cycle, it's the barber and the other cycle, it's um, he shaves himself. Um, the other way of looking at that is to step outside and ask a second order question um, and then create another dimension, which shows that the barber is in the intersection of barber and self. Um, but what I want to show just by that slide is that actually um, when we create our circularities, when we create our stable systems, we are locking ourselves into a logic inside of that. And Stafford saw that, of course, and recognized the need for the meta system. Now, the meta system if we put it into other systems like uh, Lerman or um, Spencer Brown, it is essentially a second order system asking a second order question of the emergence of your um, system ones. Uh, I'll just go to cover Spencer Brown at the moment because it's important, because if I can bring Spencer Brown into the um, VSM and Lerman, um, it, provides a very good basis for understanding tribal systems. Um, first of all, categorization and Spencer Brown and his laws of form um, start off by um, inviting us to make a distinction. Um, and that um, basically would be um, in, in Stafford's VSM, us looking at our environment and deciding what um, variety we're going to to see and perceive. Um, now, the inactivists are quite uh, interesting in this because they say you cannot perceive something without a sensor motor reaction, without movement as well as, uh, without reacting with it. And, and, and that I think is, um, to me, is sounding more and more um, realistic. Um, the other thing that Spencer Brown says, and he was the first to do it, is that to make a distinction requires an observer. It seems an obvious thing, but he placed the observer into the system. And Stafford has done that with the meta system. But the other thing that um, he, Spencer Brown says is that to make a distinction requires a motivation. Um, and that um, is also important. We'll come to that. Um, so if you read Lerman, um, you, you come to get very familiar with this, this word re-entry into the system. Um, basically, what um, Spencer Brown says is that when you make a crossing, when you make a distinction of something and you look inside that system, you can't see outside that system because it takes up your focus. Now, that actually is quite a problem that, that worried me for a long time with the VSM. The meta system is essentially managing the emergence of the system ones. It's not managing the system ones per se, it's managed, they are combined together um, to create a common purpose. And your system three, four, and five is managing that common purpose, which is the emergent property of the system ones. Now, the problem with emergence is you can't 
take something apart to find that property. It only comes with the combination of those um, objects. So it really does start to question, what is system three star? Because how can you go into the system? Well, luckily, Spencer Brown provides this answer with this concept of re-entry. System three star is a re-entry into the system. To, to do that, you have to take an image of the system in to look for the bits of the system you're interested in. So um, if I have an emergent, if I have a wheel, wheels and an engine and I put it together to get a car, I get new emergent properties like speed. Now I can't take the car apart to find speed, but if I understand what speed is, as I go in to examine the car, I can start to look at properties which might affect speed. And so that essentially describes what Systems 3 Star is doing in terms of Lerman and so on. It's a re-entry to system. Similarly, System 4 is a crossing into the environment and back. And to do that, Stafford said, System 4 needs three models a model of the system, a model of the environment, a model of itself. And that fits very neatly into Lerman and Spencer Brown because what essentially you're doing is a crossing into the environment. So uh, similarly, with the levels of recursion, you're making a re-entry. And Lerman ultimately says that every system ends up with a binary coding. Um, so art is a binary coding of beautiful or ugly. Uh, the law is um, right or wrong. Um, sorry, I've got just or unjust. I can't remember which it was now. Um, now, that makes a lot of sense because as you move up levels of recursion, your um, emergent properties have to get broader and broader to encompass what's gone below. So eventually you do end up with some sort of re-entry into a system, which is a binary um, result. In, so, in the social system perspective, re-entry is thus understood as a self-observation of the system within the system. This is the origin of relaxivity and the ability of being aware of oneself, of what you are and what you become. Now, that gets quite important for a tribe because there's no place to see what a tribe is of what you are. You have to somehow try and step out um, and compare yourself to others. Um, to be able to work out who you are. And that's the same for human beings um, and some species of animal. To actually work out what you are, you need to look at yourself in a mirror. And so here's a dolphin seeing himself for the first time. Um, now, dolphins don't behave like this. He is recognising that's him. And he's trying to look over the top of the mirror. He's trying to look underneath. He's trying to look around. The only way he can see himself, um, and, and this comes from Von Forrester, who says, uh, talks about a blind spot with logic, saying uh, you can only, um, you can't see the eye seeing. Um, and however, you can, and humans are incredibly clever in that we can place ourselves outside a system and imagine ourselves looking in. Now, there's only seven species of animals that can actually do this. Um, dolphins and whales, apes, uh, crows, um, some species of fish, and elephants, um, who seem to have this ability of self-consciousness, the ability to actually recognize who they are. It's quite interesting on YouTube, there's a, a dog called Bunny the Dog, who, um, who talks pressing buttons. Um, and when you show him a mirror, he says, who's that? Um, or you show himself in a mirror. So um, seeing yourself is, um, something that's important. Now, I'll, I'll go off piece slightly here to talk about rituals, because, because it's so hard to see inside your system, um, we create rituals to emphasize um, key points in the system to enable us to see them. So we will create a ritual to highlight the harmony or tension in the couplings um, that are important to a tribe. Um, you don't have to look very far for this. Um, you can look at um, British um, ha habit of pantomime. Um, if you want to really look at a peculiar ritual where there's an awful lot of gender swapping, 
um, and um, quite a lot of strange behaviors. Um, and ultimately, when you look, read some of the anthropologist reports of um, rituals in New Guinea and places like this, there's some very strange behaviors. And it appears, in my view, that these are designed to highlight um, where the cohesion in your organization is coming from or to highlight the tension. Um, rituals preserve identity. I, I work a lot with the military and we're still going around showing people that we don't have a sword in our right hand and um, by saluting each other. And we're still marching people around 17th century battlefields. Um, the reason is these actions ceased to be relevant years ago, but they created a considerable amount of identity. So we keep doing them. Um, rituals provide an awful lot of reassurance for people in the system. Um, and lastly, they also can be used to emphasize key roles. So when people are promoted to a role, there's normally a ceremony. We have some sort of ritual to emphasize how important that function is to our tribe. So um, I want to tackle the problem now with the homeostat. How, how are um, systems coupled? Um, let's just start off um, with the homeostat. It's, Stafford often uses it um, as a regulator to show how it reduces or amplifies variety. But what's also very important about it in the original uh, one by Ross Ashby is that it was a state changing mechanism, which changed state when the system uh, moved out of a threshold. Um, now it changed state randomly um, and the inactivists uh, are not enamored by that because there's no learning process there. One would think that if the change state, when the system went outside threshold and the homeostat went to change states, it would have learned from previous changes what was the best way. So um, it's not particularly a good learning mechanism. Structural coupling um, put forward by Mancharana and Varela um, works um, in, in a similar way. It can reduce the um, variety and it works as a regulator. Um, but it's not particularly good at adaptivity it, because the advantage of having a, an element of randomness in your state change is that you don't do the same thing each time and you find new ways of overcoming the problem. So it allows the system to adapt and accommodate new ideas. Um, so structural coupling uh, is the opposite of the homeostat. It doesn't, it's too fixed. Um, we could replace the homeostat with a neural net. Now neural nets are really good at associations, but they again, don't do adaptivity. Um, uh, uh, Cardri produces a system called a feedback multiplier, um, which is, is quite um, an interesting system. But again, it's working on what has been learned and not um, applying any adaptivity to the system. So what is essentially needed, and I don't have the answer, someone may have the answer out there, is this coupling between systems needs to be able to regulate variety through um, categorization. Um, it needs to maintain stability within a threshold using feedback. It needs to learn using um, a, a simulation techniques. It needs to be able to adapt uh, using random um, accommodation techniques from Piaget. Um, it needs um, feed forward processes. It needs priming and homeostasis. It needs satiation. In other words, if, if you um, were fed, if you fed yourself using a um, feedback mechanism, you'd be constantly eating. The body doesn't do that. When you eat, you then have a period where you don't really want to eat for a long time afterwards until you reach a stage where you're happy to eat again. Similarly, um, it needs to be able to have ha habitation in there. In other words, when you get something coming at you all the time, you get used to it and degrade its sensitivity to it. And from the inactivists, it also needs to have precariousness of, of it.
Right. So one of the problems I have with um, coupling of systems, when I tried to bring um, a lot of um, an activism into the VSM, was where are the boundaries? Now, Mantra and Varela only ever once me me mention a thing called second order structural coupling. Uh, I'll give a simple example. Um, going back to my car, I, I create a car and I'm looking at um, a transport system. So the, the land is part of the environment for that car, that the car has to run on the land. But then I start building roads. Um, and where do the roads suddenly become part of my system and become a systems one in my system? And where do I couple that with the car? So the boundary of a system um, is, is quite interesting as to what we actually call the system. And, and I think Stafford Beer nailed that by, by recognising that a lot of these things are um, really connected one way or another, and that the only way you could do that was to look at the system in focus. Um, I, I would recommend a book recently out by um, uh, Mel, Melrin Sheldrake, Sheldrake called um, Entangled Life, which shows how fungus has pretty much... Um, weft its way into almost every li living being on the, on the planet. Um, and um, we, uh, we don't have to look that far for some of these confused boundaries. If we, if we look at um, uh, mitochondria in our own cells, which we have borrowed from bacteria at some stage in development. Um, Melvin Sheldrake shows how um, plants developed from uh, algae attaching itself to a fungus um, which formed the roots. So um, where are the boundaries is, is a really um, interesting question. So um, moving on fairly quickly, uh, the system I like for this lowest level coupling comes from the inactivist, and particularly Di Paolo, where he's using Piaget's equilibration um, of assimilation, accommodation and schema. And, and in this picture, he shows four schema, which are basically circularities um, and they are coupled. Now, one of the interesting things is that um, these could be low level systems and this could be a high level system. So in the, in the genome you have in DNA, you have master genes that switch on and switch off other gene systems. Um, so what can happen in a process here is that these lower level systems can be read um, this system will read a description of them. In other words, it'll look at the emergent properties and respond to that and somehow link through um, either with a trigger or part of the circularity by forming part of the circularity or one of the components of these, it can trigger events in those. So the control system can all occur at the lowest level. And the, the place, the person who I think does this best is um, Eric Schwartz, who shows three levels um, of systems. The plane of energy, what he used to call the phenomenal world, um, where actually things happen, which is governed by morphogenesis. He then shows, um, and this comes also from Spencer Brown, who says, you know, the way we solved mathematics was to have an imaginary number. A lot of problems in mathematics was to have an imaginary number. Um, here, what we do is the relations between these things Although they're happening in the real world, we can imagine that they are occurring as a system in the plane of information and ultimately in the plane of totality, which he called um, the exponential world, um, existential world, I beg your pardon, um, the plane of information he called the pneumonal world, but that's not after Kant's uh, Neumann, which was a thing in itself. It was the original meaning of Neumann, which was... Um, a thought or an idea. So um, I wanted to move on now very quickly to um, show you how wrong Star Trek is. Um, Star Trek just shows part of the problem that we have with looking at tribes um, is that in Star Trek, right from the beginning um, with Spock and then Data and these various other characters that appeared, it's all about how logic is right and emotions are wrong. Well, um, the very opposite is starting um, to prove true. And um, Jonathan Hyatt and Joshua Green, both in their, in their books, um, 
show moral tribes and um, uh, sorry, I forget the name. I'll not come to him in a minute. Um, show that logic does not make good decisions. We need emotions um, to make decisions. Um, basically, because all decisions are circular within our systems, and that I pull from Lerman. Um, and essentially, a, a simple way of looking at this is that every end is a means um, to another end. I won't go into the complexity of decisions. Um, but if we look at it that every end is essentially a means to another end, then the problem we have um, is somewhere that has to stop. And, and the way we stop that is basically um, using our emotions to create beliefs. Um, we stop being logical and we just say, well, I'm sorry, I'm going to believe that because my experience has led me to believe that. In fact, it's inherent in our, um, our makeup. Emotions are a way of reading um, our body's uh, reactions to the world. And there's, they're a sort of language before language. They um, not only connect us to our bodies, but they enable us to communicate with other people. And they also provide us with um, motivation. Um, in, in psychology, there's a steady argument about what emotions are, and it tends to fall between those, those three things, motivations or uh, um, feelings and um, uh, communications. So th there it is, to connect ourselves to others. Jonathan Hyatt uh, reckons that reason is how we try to create our own and social narratives to create cohesion and coherence, rather than as some sort of logical system. Um, I've countered to that fairly quickly, and, and it's really all I'm trying to do is show you a roadmap of, of where I've, I've, I've gone to. Um, this ultimately ends up um, with a redrawing of the VSM like this. Now, before you all get horrified that it doesn't look like the VSM as you're used to, um, it, it, it incorporates the five key values that I keep talking about, autonomy, uh, cohesion, coherence, um, anticipation, and, and beliefs um, is a part of the system. Um, if, you, if we start at the bottom um, left-hand side, uh, sorry, the bottom down here, um, I hope you can see the arrow. Um, I'm a great believer in what the inactivists are doing, that I've got a double-headed arrow going all the way around, not quite meeting with the word action in the middle. And what that basically means is that our perception, our senses, and the context of those um, are interacted with action. And the first thing we do is to make it some sort of distinction of that world out there. Um, at this stage, what I normally try to do is to show people how um, we don't, uh, we're very um, isolated in the way we see the world. Um, a lot of birds see ultraviolet light. So when you, when you throw something, uh, a piece of plastic on the floor and a piece of bread, a seagull can see the one that glows is, is the bread. Um, a dog has a very different view of a street that we do. He, he can see the whole history of that street in the different smells and the age of the smells. We, we just see it how it is. So um, our perception and the actions that create a movement of ourselves in that environment allow us to start to make a distinction and to categorise the world. And in doing so, we then make an indication, which is a choice of some sort. And that then is the first homeostat, if you want to put it. And that whole process creates intrinsic meaning for us and sense making. We then take some sort of action and we learn from that. that the, um, the circle of this is our cohesion in our system. Um, that um, memory, emotions, which are constructed um, feelings, if you want to put it that way, um, and our intuition gives us our values. Because if we choose to do the, 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 when we come to repeat that action, it's a different choice from the first choice we made because it's based on the knowledge of how the previous choice went. So these, which are part of our, um, autotomic reactions um, sub create our value making system um, and they create coherence, intrinsic coherence for our system. And over time, they develop our norms, um, our habits, 
um, our rituals, um, our roles in our organization, and, and elements that are repeatable, our normativity. We then become self-aware because of that. Because we now have values, we have um, what I would call the Algenode. Um, Stafford Beer talked about it in Brain of the Firm, but not a lot in, in um, Heart of Enterprise. That's a driving force um, taking us to some goal. And the setup of our goals develop our structure, our purpose making, and ultimately create our identity and our beliefs and ideals. So that's my redrawing of the viable systems model and the way I um, do the subsystem. So this system is essentially imaginary. It's the, it's the way things are being organized, the self-organizing processes. But we can build the system up um, as, much as, as much as we'd like with any levels of recursion. Um, the inactivists draw it more like this, uh, circularities within circularities. Um, and that's again showing almost, um, well, it is showing a neural net. Um, right, so coming to psychology now. Um, this will work for the men, but I don't think it works much for the ladies. And I apologize beforehand that it's fairly sexist. So you walk into a bar um, and much to your surprise, they're holding a Miss World contest. Um, and all the ladies from all the worlds are there and they've all got their sashes on and they're all standing, have a drink. Obviously they're having a rest between um, the competition. So at the end of the bar are two men and um, they're obviously their minders or looking after them, but, but you somehow have wandered into this. So you go to the bar and you get your drink and you turn around, who do you go and talk to? Now, most of the men will be surprised that the first thought that went into their brain is that they're going to talk to the two men at the end of the bar. Okay. And so we're moving into um, observations from psychology now with social identity theory. And that process is called comparative fit. Um, and it's based on Eleanor Roche's prototypicality in that um, you walk, you, you categorize the world around you all the time and you choose the things that you self-categorize. So we, we, as an automatic process, we stereotype the world um, and we tend to choose things um, that we self-categorize with. So it's the best way I can describe that is the new um, boy feeling when you walk into the dining room um, of a new job and you're trying to think, who am I going to sit with? Your brain is working overtime as to, as to where and who you are most similar to. Um, so we work all the time, um, much as Lerman says, by comparing the differences. And this is in psychology, this is known as the principle of meta contrast. Um, once we've decided that we belong to a group and we want to join it, um, we want that group to be positively distinct from other groups. Um, if we can't join that group, um, we and we have to stay with our group, which we think is substandard. We will then try to recategorize our group. So they may be rich, but we're kind. We will try and categorize on some, some area that we, uh, that is important to our self-belief. In that categorization process, our group will somehow form a, a, an image of an ideal group member. Um, known as the prototypicality. And that's important because a tribe will normally choose someone who is prototypical of the group to lead them because it reflects back to them who they are. Um, and I think you could look at um, America for a good example of that and, and various other places. You can see that the prototype um, has found himself in, in the place of leadership. Um, you remember at the beginning, I said that tribes tend to be formed for survival. Unfortunately, that tends to create an us and them. You, you create in-group favoritism. You look after the people inside your group and you believe them. You, don't, you, you diminish people outside your group. It's called out-group derogation. And you don't believe them. Unfortunately, this process ends up with you being depersonalized. You start to become a group member that behaves like the prototypical group member, the more and more that group becomes salient to you. 
Um, and I'll just cover the last bit first. Sorry, I'll cover this. The, the reason for this is really important because it's way nature has solved how groups behave. What happens is we don't behave like a load of individuals in a group. What appears to happen, we behave like the group prototype when it becomes important. So we don't have to vote in nature. What we do is all behave like different, uh, like the same person. Um, and that tends to depersonalize us. Um, and the problem is we also depersonalize the other group. They become them. Um, this identity has been noted to have levels or levels of abstraction. If you have a biologist and a physicist at a science meeting, they will, in the principle of meta contrast, they will show how different they are. They will, biologists will say, well, I do this and you do that. If you then take those two and put them into an arts conference, they'll cling together and call themselves scientists. Um, so they take a higher level of abstraction where they, ab abstraction, a higher level of recursion, and that's straight out of Lerman. Um, it's interesting that most people will only join the group to a certain level, and it's called optimal distinctiveness. They like to keep an element of their personality. In actual fact, it's more than that. It's I call it the paradox, the tribal paradox. People want to belong to a group where they're all the same, but they want to be different. Um, where they don't, where people take on the identity of their group, you tend to get what's called fused identities. And that is how fundamentalists are formed. Um, the, the last part is that the, how do these people, um, what's the oil sticking all these people together? What's, what's creating, uh, what's the energy that's being used? And the energy of this is they create a group story. Slowly together, they create a narrative that is um, the story of their group. And that's how they construct the prototypicality and um, the outgroups and uh, the way they're going to behave. And I'll come to what I call viable narrative shortly, but it shows you how powerful narrative is and um, why I call it viable language. Um, here's a good uh, picture I got from the web, which shows um, Eleanor Roche's prototype theory, which came from uh, Wittgenstein. So Wittgenstein talked about how you can never describe um, rules that will make up a game, um, that will describe all games. Um, and um, he said the only way you can describe it is family resemblance. So um, th this is the reason why you can't organize your kitchen drawer and why everybody's kitchen drawer is a total mess. But it's all the things that go into your kitchen drawer. Uh, you know, the one with the knives and the spatulas in, they're all different bits, but you know they all belong in that drawer but you can't ever put them in the right order. Um, so all these people are different, but if you look at them, they all look the same. Now, um, so prototype tends to be like that. Um, there are several other theories of categorization, including exemplars and theory theory. Um, I'm gonna stick with prototype theory at the moment, but it's still an area where there's a lot of work going on. It works just like a lot of these other things with Bayesian inference. Um, and one of the things I didn't mention earlier was some really interesting work by Friston um, is showing that Bayesian probability theory in terms of Markov chains create what's called a Markov blanket, which identify boundaries. So um, Elena did this some time ago. She, the problem is you have multiple identities. And this is from uh, myself as a viable system. Um, I believe Elena did this, um, Elena Leonard did this um, several years ago. Um, but it's showing um, all the different identities that an individual might have. Um, and this shows how incredible humans are, really, that we can switch um, very quickly from one identity to another and behave um, like the prototypicality of those. So I walk into the classroom and I might behave like the lecturer. I walk into the consultants, um, uh, I walk into a, a firm and behave like a consultant. Um, and it's interesting that I'll follow, depending on the level of salience of that and the threat. Um, so I didn't mean to be pointing at husband when I said threat, right? Okay, um, so to show you the complexity of the world we live in, this is the normative relations that we, we just an example of a few. And I've, I've 
leveled them at three levels, a personal level, a group level, and a social level. But the normative relations I've put down are intimate, close, social, and business. And we tend to know instantly which one we're in. So if I go into um, your house for Christmas and you invite me there and you do everything with the turkey and the little sausages with bacon wrapped in them and that sort of thing. Um, and at the end of it, I get up. So I'm in, I'm probably close friend, I'm down here in this set of rules and normative relationships down here. If I stand up at the end of the um, uh, meal and hand you a five pound note and say, thank you very much. I've suddenly transported the whole context into a, a business state. And that doesn't always go very well. So if we try and mix love and courtship and nurturing with business, we get prostitution, which never fits well in society. And that's it's two normative behaviors. Um, if my brother um, and I inherit a house from my father and, um, and my brother says to me, I've always wanted this house for my children. Would you send me your share? And I said, of course I will. And six months later, I come along to find a housing estate being, being built on it. And when I stop the building, he says, oh, yes, your brother sold me the rights for this years ago. Um, in business, that would be quite sort of probably acceptable behavior. Between you and your brother, you may never speak again. Um, so moral framework. So I spent an awful lot of time working out what the highest level of our beliefs were, because Beliefs seem to get thrown away quite easily, and, and um, the Republican Party in America is a very good example of that. Um, they stated very strong beliefs, and then suddenly they just went out the window. Um, and the work by Jonathan Hyatt and Joshua Green has shown that actually our most basic beliefs come from our moral frameworks, which seem to be inherited from our cultures uh, at a very early age. Um, and Jonathan Hyatt puts them down as these several categorizations. Um, care versus harm, fair versus cheating, loyalty versus betrayal, liberty versus oppression, authority versus subversion, and sanctity versus degradation. The care versus harm one is quite obvious. You know, we're taught always not to harm other people. But the fair versus cheating is a very complex one. Um, some people, fairness is that you work for what you earn, what you work for. Other is that we're more fair to everybody and we share out what we have. And, and this is where the problem comes, is that the viable systems model view of, of the tribal um, systems stops at beliefs and it stops at this. It can't easily go beyond this. So tribes can't easily mix with other tribes with a different moral framework. And part of the problem is the last one, which is sanctity. Um, tribes make rituals and make areas of their beliefs um, sacred. Um, and if you look at religions, a lot of them basically start off by saying, you'll believe no other religions but this one. Um, so they actually stop you from going beyond this level of combining tribes. Um, so if we look at social identity theory back at the original one, we can see that down on the bottom left and we have um, self-categorization where we join the group. Um, that creates intrinsic meaning for us. We um, create our norms and our beliefs and our rituals in that group. And ultimately, um, we have a moral framework at the top end of that. Um, no, not sure what... Um, so coming back to viable language, viable language has, um, language has, and particularly narrative, has cohesion, coherence, anticipation, ideals, and recursion. And I'll give you a little example. Um, my father drives the train. He takes the train to London. In London, he picks up passengers. He brings the passengers home again. Each of those sentences has cohesion with the next sentence. It links from one to the other. And overall, there's a coherence of the whole story. And in fact, um, you might be anticipating the next sentence, and you probably will. And if I was to say, my father hates passengers, it would catch you by surprise, because the story's already been told in almost a childlike way for you to believe what's coming next. Um, and you could say that there's a moral in the story, and um, I haven't showed any examples, but I could include recursion where I take each sentence down into a deeper level. If I was to say my father drives a train, you can train a dog to bark, 
bark grows on trees. Each of those sentences has cohesion, but none of them have coherence as a whole. So you can see how narrative can be used um, to create um, a really powerful model of a viable system. And surely, um, and this is just speculation on my behalf, you need a viable language to describe a viable system. Now, narrative is powerful because it brings together um, the, uh, I can't read that because <laughs> different um, elements of our system with cohesive and a coherent metaphor. Now, what's really interesting is we love stories. We seem to be built around uh, absorbing stories. We tell ourselves stories all the time. Um, Joseph Campbell, um, you may have heard of him, was very big in the 70s. He's not so popular now. Um, had a thing uh, he called the monomyth. He believed that there was only ever one story that was told, and that was the story of the um, hero's journey. Um, and if you think about it, most people create um, a narrative of their own lives, which is a hero's journey. And that's exactly what tribes do. They create a story of themselves um, where they appear to be um, the, the heroes of their own journeys. Narrative um, seems to have to require these three factors, temporality, prototypicality and fictionality. And it's interesting that it has temporality. It distorts time and it distorts, fic it, it fictionizes it. And that is so um, it can be applied more generally. Um, the prototypicality is it's describing um, the tribe, um, but it often places the tribe in a fictional area um, because one of the things I've found, and it's quite useful looking at America at the moment for this, was um, if your facts don't fit your beliefs, um, you can force them into the narrative and make them fit. Um, and I saw um, a comment by someone who, um, one of the parties in America, was accused of um, uh, accused of um, th th what you're saying isn't true. And his reply was, "But it could be true." Um, and I thought that was a really telling statement. Is that what he was basically saying? Is we want that to be true. That fits our narrative. Um, gossip is a really important part of um, tribal um, networking. It was something that's totally ignored in organizations. When I worked in uh, change management, I created a gossip network um, to, to actually manage tribal changes. Um, but gossip is used to maintain norms and cohesion, but I believe it's also the algodonic signal. Um, you don't tend to gossip about something that's mundane. You gossip about things which are on the borders of your system's moral framework. Um, and the other important thing, um, going back to um, most tribes create some form of art. Um, and, and I think for many people, art isn't important and we don't put much funding to the art society or whatever. But the more I've got into it, the more I've realized how incredibly important art is, is um, art in is, itself can be a narrative and it can ask second order questions about um, subjects in a way that nothing else can because it can be so generalized and also so specific. Um, right, so Angela, I'm not sure if you want me to stop there because that's uh, an hour, I think. Um, uh, and, and I could, I, the, set, the other part is that really a second part of a lecture of how you use that to manage organizations. Um, um, well, I think that it would be good to start a discussion now because people, yes. may, many people may be tired or wanting to leave and some people have been leaving. So I am pretty okay. sure that uh, the, the topic is so extensive that um, we may consider inviting you again to conclude this conversation later on. Yeah. So, I'm very happy to. The next part is how groups make decisions and how we can use that to bring groups together or tribes together. So, Well, if you want to just give us an idea uh, briefly to, 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 to conclude, then we can open the conversation, OK? OK, so very quickly, um, we try to bring tribes together by using rational processes. Um, unfortunately, um, basically, democracy doesn't work. Um, if you have a first past the post system um, or a um, majority rule system, 
you will always create two um, two groups, those who tend to be liberal and those who tend to be conservative. And that's based on the psychology of people, some who are frightened of losing the system and some who want to see change. Um, so that tends to divide and oversimplify. If you create a um, range voting system, um, you create um, a thing called the decursive dilemma. You create a paradox of logic, which doesn't work either. And, and I'll, I'll leave it at there, but that's why humans don't use voting systems. Um, and there's been a lot of discussion by people like Rawls and Jonathan Hyatt and Joshua Green as to where we go and how we bring very diverse groups together. And that I'll leave it at that stage and not give you the solution to that. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Jonathan. Very interesting and uh, deep um, thinking and uh, proposals. So I'm pretty sure that lots of people will be wanting to jump in. Um, perhaps I will start with Gary. What, Gary was the first one who made that comment. Gary, would you like to share your comment with us? I'm sorry. What I don't I don't remember making a comment. Okay, don't worry. No, it, it is it is okay. We'll we'll carry on. I'm yes. sorry I was late getting here, but uh, this is very interesting, and I think I'm going to have to uh, study it in detail. Uh, some years ago, I did spend a lot of time looking at things like uh, what a learning organization might be. And it seems to me this is uh, a deeper and more fundamental uh, analysis than what was going on at that time by people like Senge. Uh, so I'm quite intrigued by what you've done here and I'm, I'm going to have to go look at the uh, the first half of this and think about it. So thank you. Okay, thank, thank you, Barry. Trevor, come in. Um, Jonathan, um, you may not be aware that when we did the first shift for Stafford in 2003, at the London School of Economics, which was then turned into a special edition of the Carbonetes um, Systems Journal, I did a paper called Viability Versus Tribalism for it. I think I've got that, Trevor. Yeah, and and I think I think that, uh, and I've done a load of work on that and come up with something called the Moral Modalities Framework more recently, which is a sort of five-dimensional recursive moral philosophy based on the VSM. Because I should have given you a shout out because that normative um, uh, grid that I showed was was uh, triggered by your modes of modality thing that you came up with. Uh, I, I did, it did, did bear a certain startling resemblance to it, yeah. So, so I think one of the things that, that if you look at the history of civilization and you look at questions about why certain social groups become dominant and then they collapse. I think that there is a topic of tribalism actually undermining the viability of organizations. Oh, very um, much so. And I think that's another aspect of the thing that's fascinating. And, um, and you know, this was something that was uncovered by a guy called Ibn Khaldun in the 14th century as the secret of why dynasties rise and fall. And anyway, interesting talk. Thank you very much. But the, the tension between viability and tribalism is another aspect of things that I think is significant and ne needs to be taken into account when you're trying to intervene in systems. Anyway, thank you. Thank you, Trevor. Um, Elena, would you like to comment? Um, I wanted to just make a uh, a quick insertion into the uh, the question of the timing, uh, because one of the difficulties with change is the relaxation time problem that Stafford talked about is um, sometimes it never gets quiet enough for a system or tribe to recognize its stable state. And I wondered if you might comment on that. 
That's interesting, Elena, because I haven't um, I haven't looked at that side of it before. So it's um, I I don't think um, using Lerman uh, a little bit more that they would recognise that they have a stable state. For, for them, it appears to be fairly dynamic. And, and that's why we have rituals with is a desperate attempt to try and stabilize. Um, so, so Lerman basically says that in auto, his autopoietic networks, um, that there is no time. A, a system comes into being and disappears straight away. A communication comes into being and disappears straight away. And um, the inactivists um, have a similar property they call precariousness. Um, they say a system can't adapt unless it's actually basically failing all the time and remaking itself. So, and I think, I tend to believe that's what's happening in tribes. You've got constant movement and, and Stafford's dead right. They, they never would see themselves as stable. What they're trying to do is to make themselves stable with rituals. Um, does that answer your question? Uh, well, uh, at least partially. I'm also drawn to the comment that has been made by Thomas Wong, who's one of the uh, Chinese medicine people, about walking is controlled falling. <laughs> yes. So in social identity theory, they have um, a concept of followship, um, which is, is, is encapsulated in the statement, there go my people, um, I must follow them because I am their leader. Um, and and um, that's what you see, for instance, with Donald Trump in America at the moment, is um, you, is he a leader or a follower? Um, um, because he, he it, there's a, he, what he's basically doing is reflecting back to a group of people their values. And um, that means that he can't suddenly start leading them in another direction. Um, so it's a little bit like a, a, um, a galley with... Um, a whole lot of people rowing and you've got a very small rudder um, uh -huh. who's the leader and who's deciding the direction is um, not uh, easy to determine no, that that's a very uh, that's a very interesting uh, set of comments but what I was actually saying was controlled falling f-a-l-l -L -L -I. oh, sorry <laughs> <laughs> sorry the, the, um, no I'm unstable and so when we walk you know yes. it's controlled Collapse. Or falling. Sorry. Yes. Um, yeah. No, I would agree with that. That's walking is controlled falling. Yes. And um, you're looking at um, systems that are, uh, well, I think the words um, stable, far from equilibrium is, is a good example of, of yeah. a good definition. They, they are always on the edge. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you, Elena. We have a, a comment from Google Funk. Uh, yes. Uh, a couple of comments. Uh, Jonathan, thank you very much for your uh, presentation. It was really very insightful with so many aspects and it sprang up a, f a firework in my head. Um, just a couple of issues, uh, topics, uh, building on what we were talking about uh, uh, just before on the tempor temporal dimension. <clears throat> this is something that I also I miss a bit in the in the VSM, and uh, I try. I like to relate it to Luhmann, and it brings me back to your circularity uh, issue. Is uh, if you look at Luhmann and how he defines temporality, it's more of a sequence. You have a, you have a past, you have a present, and the future, and I think that's um, something that's that's a bit missing for me in the VSM, and and it ties into the aspect of circularity. If we look at the circularity in, in the VSM, it, it su suggests uh, that uh, more or less things don't change, they, they remain stable. Um, so you've, you know, feeding back and, and then the, the two poles in, in this feedback loop, they, they, they're, they're more or less constant, they don't, they don't change. But in reality, and I think that's what we need to focus a bit more on if we, talk, if we use the VSM, both poles change, they are not the same. Uh, <clears throat> so. I give a feedback and the, and the other pole, the other pole is, is changing and gives me feedback and I'm changing. So I, I, the question is whether the circle and circularity is, is the re, a good image for what is really going on there. Could be more like a spiral, you know, you're, uh, it's, it's a constant evolution uh, of, of, you know, of, of, of a relationship. Um, 
so that's what, what we should probably think uh, in, in this direction we should go a bit stronger uh, I like very much what you said about the home uh, um I think we also as well we have to define it more as a sort of in a, in a learning uh, perspective um, it's probably in the in, I mean, it's it, it, the theory, the VSM is coming from a certain, uh, you know, it's it, it reflects a certain uh, perspective, a certain, uh, uh, you know, a moment of time in, in the develop, development of theories. Um, and it could be viewed too, too passive and too static. And I, I agree with you, we, we should go more into to sort of a the learning uh, direction. Uh, I also like very much your cognitive dimension, Luhmann, Spencer Brown. What I find very interesting, if you look at Heart of Enterprise, at the, at the end here, Stefan Peer gives us an overview of, of sort of his sources of influences and he uh, lists Spencer Brown. And my question is, and I was just recently discussing with a professor, a professor in, in Germany is uh, how we can link them more closely together, um, Spencer Brown and, and the VSM. And in that regard, I also liked your approach, uh, your hint to view uh, system three star, sort of a re-entry function uh, and I think that's true. Uh, the system three function, the task of the system three function, one of the main tasks is to sort of to generate the different perspectives on 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 the operational organization, uh, on on the systems one. And I think we have to uh, develop that that perspective much um, much further. You can, I think, in my in my view, you can view all the systems functions as a sort of a re-entry into the organization. Each system functions. Uh, generates a different perspective on the organization. And I remember one small comment in, in Heart of Enterprise where uh, Stafford P is talking about the uh, algedonic channel, where he says that the algedonic channel is even orthogonal to the meta system and system five itself. So you have, it's, it's, it's an architecture of, you can view the, the variable system as, as an architecture of def, taking different perspectives. Uh, uh, the more you climb up sort of the, the, the system functions. Um, I think one, one issue where we have to be careful, you mentioned that uh, people, it was, that's the way I understood it, that people are allocated to systems functions. That's not how I view it. In my view, as people uh, exercise different systems functions, depending on also their organizational role, uh, a chief executive can yeah, probably works mostly in system three, but he can also take over system four functions when he's talking about strategy innovation. He also has a system five role sometimes when he his values and uh, his judgments, his uh, principles generate the eth ethos. So I, 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 I don't know when, whether we really can allocate people uh, and also certain organizational functions to, to systems functions in the VSM. Yeah, uh, certainly it's, it's, it's short of human behavior, but I think that's okay. I mean, I, I think we should also be careful about what um, um, a model can say and what it can't say. And we, I think we shouldn't add too many different aspects. And it's clear, the VSM, it's not a, a, a model about human behavior. But I think that's also its strength. It shows us more sort of the organizational roles and how people are forced into their organizational roles um, and the, the roles that they have to play. And that's also a phenomenon. If you look at the organizational literature, um, there's this th distinctions between uh, people in an organization and people as persons. And when people enter an organization, they behave differently because they have to exercise certain roles. And I think that's the aspect that the VSM can show us that how people have to change and adapt their role and behaviors and personalities due to their organizational roles. Uh, what it doesn't discuss is more, the, more or less the, the, the psychological aspect and the behavioral aspect, but I think that's okay. And we should leave it and, and not try to, to, to um, put too many aspects into the VSM. So <laughs> to cut it short, <laughs> I hope... Uh, uh, I made myself clear. Yeah, that's fine. So uh, I'll tell a small story. Um, I um, normally stand in front of my crew. Um, I'm, I'm a captain on a ship. And I show them a picture of the pipe drawn by Magritte at, um, that's in the Peggy Gungenheim Museum in Venice. 
And underneath it, Magritte wrote, this is not a pipe. Uh, and we have a discussion about it. I say, what is it? And they say, it's a pipe. And I say, but the artist says it's not a pipe. And we normally spend about 20 minutes and they eventually decide that the artist was being stupid and that it's the pipe. So I then hand it to one of them and say, could you smoke it for me then, please? And they said, I can't, it's not a pipe. And I said, you just told me for 20 minutes it's a pipe. And they said, ah, it's a representation of a pipe or it's a picture of a pipe. So I said, great. So then I hold up an email and as the artist underneath the email, I've written, this is not work. Um, and um, I say to them, well, if it's not work, what is it? And they normally, there's someone who gets it and he says, it's a representation of work. And I say, right, so what's really interesting, what's another way of saying uh, what's a representation of work is organizing or planning. And I say, so why are we sending, why are we organizing and organizing and organizing? Because organizing? all we seem to do is send emails. Um, and um, the point I'm trying to make, I, I think some of the points are very, firstly, um, my little diagram um, redrawing the VSM is, is meant to be a spiral. It's just that I'm not very good at drawing. It's, it's a sort of semi-spiral that comes back on itself um, um, to try to show that circularity and Lerman and the, 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 the constantly moving. But not only that, to show that it's the yellow is the environment and it's trying to show that it's sitting in the environment, which... Stafford took it out of the environment um, for, for clarity, but um, you know, it, it, the system is in the environment and it's um, part of the environment. Um, the, which, the whole point I'm trying to make is that um, any organization, those people that are organizing, it is only organizations where people actually exist in, in that um, in that area. If you take any other system, the, the organizing aspects are imaginary, um, yet we don't need to make them. We actually put people in there. But interesting enough, those people themselves become tribes, and hence the current um, belief that they've created themselves into elites. So um, I, I, I differ slightly with what you're saying. I think um, organizations um, are a special way that humans um, organize themselves, <laughs> hence the name. Um, but underneath that, we're still living our tribal identities and we tend to just totally ignore them. D does that sort of respond? Okay. But thank you very much, um, Jonathan and Wolfgang. Um, we're running out of time, and um, so I'm going to only allow the last uh, three questions. We have Jeremy, Jeremy Gross. Do you have a comment, Jeremy? You need to unmute. Unmute. Sorry about that. I lost my cursor for a second. Um, I, I, I'll, I'll leave someone else to comment because I'm sure other people have more important things to say. Thank you, Jeremy. We have also a question from Q. Uh, he may Might not be, he, he may have gone. Okay. Yeah, you know, 23 people. Um, John Lee had a, a comment as well. You have nope. to unmute. Can you, can you do it? Click, click, nope. click on the click on the buttons. You have to unmute. Oh, oh. doesn't seem to be that he's been unmuted. Click click on the three dot dots. No, I don't. And then you get a thing. But he do it himself. So, well, let's. Go with another person while John finds the way to um, unmute. Yeah, uh, Elena, do you have a final comment? Uh, no, that's okay. Okay, okay. Uh, Marta, do you wanted to make a comment? Uh, <clears throat> oh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm connecting from Colombia, and here we are trying to coordinate a network of networks of, 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 uh, of uh, groups, uh, small groups, but also big associations 
all working for life care. And my question is, I mean, we are really needing to get to know how to get organized, although we are uh, trying to, we are organizing right now like organic, in an organic way, but looking really how to, how, how are we going to connect all these networks and all these uh, aspects of the boundaries. So my question is, Jonathan, uh, which is the next thing you're looking forward in terms of uh, uh, how, when can we really start uh, uh, getting all these ideas uh, together or, or start uh, putting them into practice or uh, having more discussions and, and, and getting something that uh, uh, creating that narrative that you that you were talking about and, and and start putting it into discussion and into practice because we are really needing needing all these uh, uh, materials to 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 for our, our organization. Right, so the way I analyze an organization is to tease out what tribes there are, there are in the tribe. So first I look for rituals, I look for identity, uh, I try and establish what groups you have. Um, the, the graph I've put up there was developed by Garaj Andy, who was a student of Akoff. Um, and he talks about how most of the time we create a dichotomy between two choices. Um, but to actually get groups together who feel differently, um, if you take the fact that um, every means is an end, uh, every end is a means to another end, and that we end in beliefs, you, you have to try, the only way you're going to get your groups together, if you want to, um, you can get them to collaborate or get into competition with each other, but if you want them to cooperate fully, you need to get them into the same belief system. And you cannot do that with an email. Um, you know, you, the only way you can do that is to get to, to it, it, your business problem you've got is this depersonalization where people don't see other people as people. They see them as a, a, an outgroup and um, they behave badly towards them. So to get people to work together, um, you really need to get them to play together, to act together, to uh, you, you need to get as uh, as much um, groups together as you can. Uh, when I talked to uh, Chichester County Council once, they said we we need much more uh, cooperation between you know the fire brigade, the nurses, the town hall. And I said, well, what do you do together? And they said, well, nothing. But we do send out a, an email once a month. Uh, you, you actually need to be build people's belief systems from the ground up. And what Garajandi says, um, if you want to get groups that are opposed in conflict together, is you need to start developing the means to develop new ends and new beliefs. And you need to suspend ends and beliefs to start with. But uh, the trouble is, people won't give up their beliefs easily. So it's only often when they've gone through really serious conflict, they finally say enough's enough, let's let's start seeing how we could just come together in a small means. But it's actually, uh, my expression is do lots of stuff, do lots of stuff together. Um, and that then starts to build cooperation, um, which is what you need and a belief system. Does, does that make sense? Yes, uh, uh, we, uh, we, we've also moved, we've already moved some about uh, in that term and, uh, and we are uh, really getting it, that, that, but there's a lot, lot more to do on, 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 on that subject. So maybe, and, yes, we can continue talking after that. And if you consider that emotion drives all of this and feelings, then you need to have integrity, you need to build trust. Um, mm -hmm. all, all of those uh, old fashioned words actually do work. Okay, yeah, thank you. Right, um, I think that, um, all right, John Lee is saying that he, he he's not gonna necessarily need to talk. So, well, in the in this case, I think that we can conclude this meeting. Thank you again, Jonathan. Really interesting uh, perspective. I think that um, you've give us a lot of food for thought. I'm sure that if we had another opportunity to discuss things with you, that will be lovely. Perhaps uh, we can do um, next year, as we have discussed before. Uh, have the possibility of um, going further into your ideas and how do you, do you put this in, into practice. 
Um, before we conclude, uh, people were, were asking about the recordings. We are uploading the recordings in the Metaforum webpage. If you click in the Metaforum webpage and look for the webinar series button, then you will see an update of the last conferences and uh, we'll be updating last, la the last one on this one in the next few days. And um, and before we, we close, uh, we're going to be updating the webinar plan, the webinar series plan for next semester. Uh, in this moment, we are receiving um, uh, suggestions. We have already four speakers that um, have been allocating the first slots next year. But if any one of you wants to uh, make a proposal for a talk, please send us a proposal. Uh, we need to know the title, a, a brief description of the proposal, and a brief uh, um, CBS from you. Uh, so uh, we are welcome to listen to more proposals. And uh, anyway, thank you very much to be with us. And uh, Merry Christmas to all of you. Uh, if we don't see you again uh, and see you next year for those of you that are not participating in the ease integration uh, experiment that will start next Monday. So thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Awesome. Merry Christmas. Merry Bye. Christmas. Bye. 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 Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Come,